you would please turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Different times throughout life, things come up. Seemingly ordinary events. But in hindsight, they take on some significance. Some, uh, one such situation is one that we're going to look at in the life of Abraham this morning. For Abraham, it started as a normal day. He was resting under a tree in the, the coolness there. He looks up and he sees some visitors showing up. So how do we respond with different situations like that? Interestingly, this past week I had a visitor show up. I was sitting out front on my step and someone showed up along the road and called out for help. And over that, that afternoon, <coughs> Thursday, I got to spend some time with him, talk with him. And he was saying he was wanting to come to church with us this morning, but unfortunately yesterday he ended up in the hospital. I'm not sure what went on. So, but different events that come into our lives, we don't know exactly what God's doing. Sometimes we wonder, is God in the midst of what we're dealing with and what we're going through? There's a, a saying that's been around and a poem that was written. I know we have the, the opening line to this, this poem. It's on a plaque that we used to have hanging in our house and then we took it down to paint. The opening line is, Christ is the head of our home. The poem goes on the next couple lines. It says, the unseen guest in every room. The silent listener to every conversation. The idea that God is there. It's the reminder that God is there seeing and listening to what's going on in our homes. Sometimes it can be more prevalent than others. What Abraham experiences he doesn't realize at first, but God himself shows up in the flesh to his home. It's an interesting story. How does he handle that? How does someone respond to God? Abraham initially had no idea it was him. His wife Sarah laughed at what God had to say because it seemed impossible. But what, what took place in that, in that tent? All those years ago. Please follow along with, my, with me as I read, beginning in verse 1 of Genesis 18. It says, The Lord appeared to him, that's Abraham, by the terrible trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. And said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. And after that you may pass by, inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And they said, Do as you said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and said before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening to the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in years, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I pleasure, my Lord being old also. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I'll return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he 
He said, no, but you do. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Let's pause for a word. Dear Heavenly Father, too often we don't, for, we don't remember that you are in our very presence. That is the God of the universe. You are everywhere present. You see and you hear what is going on throughout the entire world at the same time. You know our thoughts. You know our conversations. Lord, I pray that you might learn just a little bit from the example of Abraham this morning. On how to respond to the fact that you are here. And Lord, how we can respond to those around us. Lord, please teach us this morning that we might be more like you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Amen. For Abraham, it started as a normal day. He got the morning chores done. It was probably getting hot out, so he went and sat down under a tree to rest. In the coolness of the sheep. We like to do that when we've been out working in the heat, don't we? We like to take a time out, sit down in some shade, grab a cup of ice water, and just rest. That's what Abraham was doing. When all of a sudden he looks up, and he says he sees three men standing there. Now the scripture says these are men, they appear as men, but as we follow the story later on through this chapter and the next couple chapters, we discover that these are not men. Two of which are angels. They will then go to Sodom and pull Lot and his family out of that city before the city is destroyed. The third person, who really is none other than Jesus himself, come down in the form of a man before he became a baby in that manger to deal with certain things going on here on the earth. So what happens here? It says Abraham looks up and sees them. How does he respond to these visitors? How does he respond to visitors that just simply show up on his doorstep? For him, it was no inconvenience. It says he goes out of the tent door and meets them and bows down on the ground at the common greeting in that time. He says, my Lord, if I found favor in your sight, do not pass by. Let me bring a little water to wash your feet, and you can rest under the tree. And he says, let me bring some food for you. They be nourished, and then you can go on. He says, yes, you've been traveling a while. You need to stop and rest. Let me wash your feet. Let me give you some water to drink and some food to eat so you continue on your journey. Now, in those days, it was nothing like what we have in America today. Today, when we go on a trip across country, you go down, and as you're cruising down the road, you get hungry, what do you do? You pull over in a town and start knocking on the door saying, hey, can I have something to eat? No, we don't do that. We have restaurants all over the place. We just go to a restaurant, pick whichever one you want. There's usually plenty of them. You go in and get some food. But in Abraham's day, it obviously wasn't like that. He had to rely on those around to help him out. So Abraham says, let me help you. Let me give you some water so you can get your feet washed so they aren't so filthy and dirty from walking in the sand. Something to drink to cool down. Take a rest under my favorite tree. Let me give you some food so you can have energy to continue on. And he's saying, let me supply you. Let me take care of you. Let me strengthen you. And then you can continue on to where you need to go. When people come and ask us for help, how do we respond? Well, let me ask you this question. Do we respond before they even ask? Do we simply look out the world around us, see a situation, see a need, and say, here, how can I help you? Let me help you. Let me give you a cup of cold water. 
Maybe you need a place to sit and rest. Maybe you need something else. Let me help you out. So Abraham didn't know exactly who it was, but it says the, the men say to him, Do as he say. Sure, I'll stay. I'll be your I'll be your guest. And so what does Abraham do? He deliberately goes out then to make sure everything is needed. Everything that would be needed is provided. He first goes to Sarah's wife and says, make some bread so we have something to feed. And then he goes to his servants. He picks out the best calf. Takes it to his servants and said, slaughter this animal. Cook up the meat real quick so we can provide a meal. Now meals in those days took a little while to prepare. Abraham himself was involved in whatever capacity he was in. He was planning it out. He was getting everything ready. And when the meal is ready, he takes it and personally serves it. He does everything he possibly can to honor his guests, to take care of them, to nurture them. And after they sit down and eat, we don't know long, how long they've been there. Abraham hears some, some interesting comments. It says in verse 9, they said to him, where is Sarah your wife? Now culturally, when the men show up and visit, the men were, would be in conversation and the wife and the other ladies would be back a little bit. That was just culture, that was normal. But these guys said, where's your wife at? Why isn't she out here? She should be included because they have a message for her. So Abraham says, she's right here in the tent. Obviously, the tent would have been close by. She was definitely within hearing range. She knew what was going on. She knew the conversation. And so this man, presumably Jesus at this point, verse 10, he says, I will surely return to you according to the time of life. Behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now for Sarah at this point, just try to imagine what was going on in her. Maybe it's not so difficult to imagine. She's been longing a son for years. God had promised Abraham that he would have a child and through him nations would be born. The years tick by. Nothing. No kids. They're getting older. We looked at it last time where Sarah said, you know what? <coughs> Abraham, why don't you have a child by my servant? We talked last week about what happened with that and how that turned out to be an absolute disaster. The substitute child, it did satisfy the longing Sarah had in her heart. And here she receives word that she herself is going to have a child. So how does she respond? It says she was listening. It says in verse 12, Sarah laughed within her heart. In a sense, she's saying, yeah, right, God. Like that could ever happen. She has absolutely no faith in it whatsoever. She has no idea that God in the flesh has just said. She thinks it's just three strangers along the road coming up with a story that would sound nice. But she doesn't believe it at all. After all, what evidence was there? She had been trying for years, for decades, and nothing And then when she hears someone seem to flippantly say, oh yeah, within a year from now you're going to have a kid, she's like, not a chance. Not a chance. Is there something in your life that you've been longing for and seeming never getting? And then if you hear someone say, yeah, you'll get that, no problem. In your heart you say, yeah, right. In your heart you say, there's not a chance in the world. Even God himself isn't doing it. Remember, Sarah has already resigned herself to the fact she's never going to have kids. And she says, after I'm old, shall I have this pleasure? My Lord, my husband being old also. She says, take a look at the facts. The facts don't line up. The facts say this is an absolute impossibility. But there's one thing we must remember. 
There's one thing we have got to keep burned into the depths of our minds. Is whenever life says something is absolutely impossible, it cannot happen. Remember this. God is the God of the impossible. God can do anything. If God can simply speak and create everything, is anything too difficult for God? For God to be able to take care of our needs? It's easy for us. Does that mean God will give us whatever our hearts desire? No, it doesn't. But he will give us exactly what we need, exactly what we need. He never, he never gives it to us early. Usually he waits for the absolute last moment. Why? So we can put our trust in him. That's exactly what it was like with, with Joshua as they were getting ready to cross the Jordan River, wasn't it? Joshua told the priests that were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, the Ark was a massive box covered in gold, extremely heavy. And he tells these men carrying on poles, go and walk into the Jordan River with it. That river was at flood stage, roaring really fast. That water could easily have knocked them in. And God said, I want you to carry that into that flooding river. And it wasn't until after those men had gone into the river that God stopped the water. He could have done it beforehand. But he said, no. You get in that water, you get your feet wet, and then I'll stop the water. And he did. And the entire nation then could cross over. Sometimes God requires us to act by faith, not knowing how God's going to provide. And God will take care of what he has promised to give us. He will take care of our need. So how does how does this all play out? Verse 13, the Lord says to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? Then here's the question, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Life gets difficult at times. We know that life is not easy. Life is a struggle. Life is painful. But the question we must come back to is this one. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer to that question is no. Nothing is too difficult. But when God says something's going to happen, it will happen. And for Sarah, he makes this promise. He says, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. Of course, Sarah denies it, trying to save face. says, no, I didn't laugh. But God knew she did. God knew what she had done. And he says, no, but you surely did laugh. And there the men get up to leave. Is anything too difficult for God? That's the question we have to wrestle with. That's the question we come back to time and time again. God knows everything, does he not? God sees everything, does he not? God is all powerful, is he not? God knows our hearts. He knows our struggles. He knows our weaknesses. And he cares about us. And so Abraham, he sees these men get up. They're heading towards Sodom. And as these men start heading in the direction of Sodom, what goes through Abraham's mind at this point? We don't know. We don't know. But for Abraham, what did Sodom represent? It represented a couple different things. One, it obviously represented a very sinful city. He knew about that city. But he also knew his nephew Lot was there. With the realization that God was just speaking and made this promise about Sarah, now his eyes are fixed on Sodom. 
Abraham's heart, I'm sure, is starting to wonder what's going on. And, and so he begins to ghost with them, to send them on their way. As his visitors leave his home, he doesn't just say, have a nice day. He goes out on the road and walks a little ways with them. We don't know how far they went or what the conversation was about. But then verse 17 says, the Lord says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely be a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed with him. And then the verse is following for the rest of the chapter. The two angels go on to the city. God stays with Abraham, and they begin to have a conversation about what's going to happen to that city. But Abraham's heart is one of service. When God come, came to his doorstep, he didn't know it was God. Rather, he said, how can I serve? He looked up and saw a need, and he didn't even hesitate to go out and meet that need. He gave the best that he had, both from food and his shade tree. He served them and sent them on their way. Now we do not have God physically present with us today. He is here, don't get me wrong, but he is not physically present. After Jesus went back up to heaven, after his resurrection, he issued in a time where God would not be here physically on earth. Instead, he sent his spirit to guide us and to instruct us. But he did leave a statement that we need to stop and think about. Jesus told his disciples, whatever you have done to the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me. Whatever you have done to the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me. The context there was with children, but the application goes to how do we treat people? However we treat people around us is the way we are treating God. As if God in the flesh was in there. So how do we treat people? How do we treat people that wander up to our homes, walking down the street, calling out for help? As the gentleman did Wednesday night in my home. There were certain things that he needed, and I did what I could to help him out. Then I saw him again Thursday and sat down and talked to him for a while. And he does need our prayers. He's struggling. I have some idea on why he's in the hospital, because he shared with me some medical issues that he's going through. But how do we treat people we encounter? Do we see a need and brush it aside saying, you know what, someone else can take care of that? If we do that, we have literally said, God, I'm not going to take care of you. Instead, we need to say, how can I help? Are our eyes focused on the needs around us? Because if they are, then we're on the lookout for how can I serve God? If our eyes are simply on ourselves, in essence, we're telling God, I don't care about you. I don't care about myself. Where's our heart at this morning? Where's our focus? Where's our vision? Now, I will admit, admit I'm not perfect at this. I miss opportunities, too, that I realize afterwards, I blew that one. We all do that. But the important thing is, is to be able to realize what we've done and say, God, please forgive me. Give me another chance. I want to help. Give me another chance. There are people all around us that are hurting. People all around us who are in need. Sometimes the needs are obvious, sometimes not. 
Sometimes the people appear to be perfectly fine, but sometimes their heart is hurting. Sometimes a person just needs someone to, that will listen to them. Someone that says, you know what, I care enough to listen to your anger. Maybe there's something I can do to help. And if I can't really help that situation, maybe I can find help for you. To get someone that can take care of that people. That's what being the hands and feet of Jesus are all about. It could be as simple as what Abraham did, seeing some visitors and saying, let me take care of you. Provide a meal, send you on your way. But whatever it is, are we being the hands and feet of Jesus? After all, Jesus did what for us? What was it that Jesus did for us? That's what communion is all about, the reminder that Jesus died for us. His body was broken. His blood shed for us. Can we do no less for him? In the Sudan, there's a Christian lady that has been condemned to death simply for naming the name of Christ. She was given an opportunity to denounce her faith in Christ, to become a Muslim and be spared. But she said, I will never turn my back on my word. And she will be executed for her faith. Do we turn our back on the Lord when we don't take care of those around us? When we say, God, I'm all about you. Let's pause the Lord in prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Lord, too often we forget what you have done for us. Too often we forget. take care of the least of these. Those around us. Those who have needs. Lord, sometimes you make it obvious and bring them to our doorsteps. Lord, sometimes it's not so obvious. Lord, I pray that you would help us keep our eyes open to the pain that's around us. To the needs that are around us. Lord, help us to offer an encouraging word, a helping hand. Lord, it could be something simple, something easy that we spot. But Lord, it might be a little bit more involved. For Abraham, it cost him some food and his best camp. But Lord, because of it, he was able to then receive word and the promise of a son and then intercede on behalf of an entire city. Lord, help us to keep our eyes focused on the sufferings of this world. Lord, it comes in so many different forms. Sometimes it's difficult to see all of these. Lord, I pray that you help us to be able to reach out and do something to help someone in your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I'd like to ask the As we come to this time to remember the Lord's table, what was it that Jesus did on the cross? He could have at any moment said, I want to do it my way. At any moment he could have said, deal off. It's all about me. But he recognized that there was something far greater than momentary. 
momentary suffering. Suffering, though, for him would only last a few hours. Something far greater than our soul and mind. As he went to that cross, shed his blood, died for us. Jeff, will you ask the blessing of our friends? Father, as we contemplate what you did for us on the cross, what you did for us, Father, when you came to earth. By your broken body, we celebrate this morning. Father, that you took our garbage to the cross that we might have life. Father, it's at times hard to wrap our mind around what a great gift salvation truly is. And Father, that it is a gift. Because Jesus, you did what none of us could ever do. And you opened the door by allowing us to come to you. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body that we celebrate this morning and what you did for us. We thank you and we praise you.
fill out this new covenant in my blood. I do this as often as you drink of it. Lord, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Lord, you begin just showing mankind that from the time of the fall when you shed the blood of the young to make skin coverings for Adam and Eve. Continued on, Lord, through the many sacrifices in the Old Testament and finally culminating in the shedding of Jesus' name. as the perfect penalty for our sin. Lord, we don't deserve it, but we thank you for it. Lord, I pray that we might go from here with fresh eyes of the world around us, that we might see ways in how we can minister to those around us, and in so doing, Lord,